Now we want to take a look at what are called meridional sections of the world ocean. You can think of them as slices, vertical slices of the world ocean. This is really definitely a scientific kind of word. Uh, meridional or meridional sections of the world ocean. The closest thing for you to kind of key in on is that there's slices along meridians. And if you think about the prime meridian, the place where time starts in a sense, Greenwich mean time, it'll give you some idea of slices. But if you just want to say vertical slices of the world ocean, just looking at the ocean from the surface to depth, that's fine too. Because uh, I get tripped up on this word, meridional circulation as well. Typically it's along lines of longitude, but I've seen vertical slices called meridional sections for other kinds of, it's really just a vertical uh, section. And we can use an orange, if you think of slices of an orange, this is a mer meridional section of an orange. If you cut an orange, you're looking at the interior of the orange. What we just looked at when we looked at the distribution of surface temperature and salinity, we were looking at the outside of the orange. Now we want to take a slice and look at the properties of the world ocean or as looking at the interior of the orange. Hopefully that analogy works. Well, here's a slice of the Atlantic Ocean as you see here in this inset. This is from Iceland down to the Southern Ocean. So we're actually just taking a slice of the Atlantic Ocean from the surface down to the bottom across this region right here. And I really want to impress upon you how much work went into this single image. It really represents a 10-year effort in an uh, experiment called the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, or WOS, a major oceanographic project. It re represents thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of man-hours, um, thousands of ship stations, probably millions of data points that went into creating just this one vertical slice of the North Atlantic Ocean. Here we're looking at, at seawater temperatures and it's listed as potential temperature and for the oceanographers among you that will have some meaning to it. It takes adiabatic uh, compression effects into account. Otherwise just think of it as temperature, seawater temperature. It's not going to be important for our lay purposes here but just so you know there is some difference and you can look that up in the book if you're interested in that. Here we have depth. This is in meters, so this is 6,000 meters deep. You see along the bottom here the seafloor. This is likely the mid-Atlantic ridge, and uh, although we're looking at a slice going down this way, so we're probably crisscrossing the mid-Atlantic ridge in a couple places along here. We'd have to look at a bathymetric map to actually figure out what exact features this represents along the seafloor. But here you see the seafloor. And here you see colder water, the coldest water in fact, minus 0 0.5 degrees in the Southern Ocean. This is Antarctic, Antarctica, or the Southern Ocean. This is the Arctic. Again, the land comes all the way right up to here because we started in Iceland. You see the warmer water at the surface, not unexpectedly, and the layers of the ocean in terms of ocean temperature. Although these layers, actually the coldest waters come up near the surface here because of Antarctica being so cold. Now of course this doesn't go all the way to the north because sea ice likely prevented uh, us from going, presented, prevented these oceanographers from going any further s north, um, but it looks like it also um, represents right the edge of the Antarctic continent. But this is what the ocean looks like, the physical structure of the world ocean in a slice of the world ocean in terms of temperature from north to south in the Atlantic Ocean. If we look at the thermocline, the region where we find rapid changes in temperature, here's what we see. And we see the thermocline actually goes up to the surface so that this water here at the very surface in the southern ocean is actually the same water that we find at the bottom. So we actually find a very cold water all the way up to the surface and that's going to have important implications later on. So this is what we call the permanent thermocline and it's caused by formation of water masses uh, and an interface between the sort of deeper circulation and the surface 
uh, water masses. And we'll talk more about that when we get into ocean circulation in the next chapter. We can do the same thing in the Pacific Ocean. So here we have a slice from far in the North, North Pacific Ocean all the way down to the Southern Ocean. So North Pacific Ocean, Southern Ocean, different oceanic ridges. This is perhaps, uh, no, I was gonna say it's East Pacific Rise, but the East Pacific Rise is over here. So again, we'd have to look at a bathymetric map to figure out exactly what these features represent. But again, looking at the layering of the ocean in terms of its seawater temperatures, here you see, of course, in the central part of the ocean and at the surface of the Pacific Ocean, we have the warmest waters and we find cold water throughout the Pacific Ocean, unlike we did in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's a subtle detail for an advanced oceanography class, not even a subtle detail, it's an important detail for an advanced oceanography class. We're not going to get into it in too much detail here, but just so that you recognize that in the Atlantic Ocean, cold water is stopped from spilling over into the North Atlantic Ocean. In the Pacific Ocean, that cold water from the Southern Ocean can infiltrate all the way up into higher latitudes, up into the Northern Hemisphere. We can do the same thing with salinity. Here again, Iceland, Southern Ocean, sea, sea floor, and we can see that we have this injection of low salinity water. And if it's sinking here, even though the salinity here is fresher than the salinity here, how can that be? Well, of course, this water has to be colder and it's the coldness of the water that's affecting its density more so than its salinity. So even though this water is less salty, it's colder and so it sinks versus this very high saline water at the surface. Now, of course, you know that the higher the salinity, the more dense the water, and so it should sink, right? But this is also the warmest water. So you have the counteracting effects of temperature and salinity, and both of those factors, temperature and salinity, are going to affect the density or the buoyancy of the water and ultimately determine its layering. But in a sense, in the same way that we saw the complexity with the surface, sea surface salinities, the vertical slices of salinity as well uh, have some complexities to them. And we can look at the permanent halocline as well as in the Pacific Ocean as well. And again, some other subtleties uh, of to look at here. Here's that, if you remember that surface water, those lowered sea surface salinities that we saw in the global sea surface salinity map, here they appear in this image as well. 